All right, good evening, everybody. How is everyone doing? All right, we're in store for quite the treat here at our late show here in Corning, New York. Uh, first of all, let's, this is the man with the blowpipe. This is Aaron Jack. Let's give him a nice round of applause. <laughs> and next, the star of the show, we have Anna Knoll. She's in the corner, there we go. All right. Uh, we've also got George and Frederick on stage. My name is Heather, if you have any questions. I also want to take a moment and welcome our live stream viewers who are joining us from all over the world. Yes, I know Anna has some people in Austria watching. So hello, Anna's friends. Mom, is Anna's mom watching? Yes, hi, Anna's mom. And grandma, oh, from all the way over there. Well, welcome from your homes here to Corner Museum of Glass. Now, Anna and Aaron have been working together on a piece. Anna has cold worked uh, a grawl. So we have all these different ways to put color and pattern into the glass. Um, Aaron in the hot shop has layered up different colors into a bubble. And then Anna, after that bubble has cooled down, she's cut into it this beautiful intricate design, which we have over here on our marbling table right next to Anna. Now while Aaron is working in the hot shop, we've also set up a cold shop down here in the amphitheater. Anna will be cutting the glass with a brass wheel that's embedded with diamonds. Okay, so you'll be able to get a taste for both worlds, hot and cold. We're talking about glass. All right, so we're very pleased that Anna has joined us. She's joined us all the way from Austria. Oh, great shot up there in the AV booth. I don't know if we can focus in on the darker one. There it is. So this is a similar project to what Anna is working on. Is that the same pattern, too, a similar pattern? Very similar pattern. All right, so Anna has joined us from Austria. She is from Kromsok. Got it right. I might butcher some of these names, so bear with me. Uh, she learned at a school, a glass Fachschule school, sorry. <laughs> it is a glass trade school though, so she started from a very young age learning how to cold work the glass. She was also very technically versed in the material. Um, so this school is based on Kromsok. It's in Tyrol, a state of Austria. It was established in 1948. So the school has been around for a long time. Uh, we have a special person who went to that school and teaches around here now. His name is Max Erlocker. So here in Corning, New York, this is a very special year. We're celebrating 150 years of glass making. Yeah, I think we can applaud that. That's something to celebrate, right? Yeah. So with this celebration, we've introduced cold working to our demonstrations at the museum. So if you're close, you should try, come on out and see someone working on a cold in the cold shop, which we have up here in display. Oh, I'm going to pass around, if you're in the audience, I'm going to pass around a cold work piece of glass. Um, I'm not sure if Anna made this one or not, but you can feel the texture and how deep she's cut into the glass with this wheel. So of course, with her many years of experience, Anna knows how hard to push onto the wheel. She knows the angle to hold the glass up and against the wheel. The wheel is made out of a brass um, and it's embedded with industrial diamonds. So it's more like a file, not a blade. Anna can touch that wheel and not cut her hand, okay? So she'll slowly remove layers of glass. I'm, I'm mesmerized by how quickly Anna can work. Um, I've tried cold working and it takes me hours to get just a nice perfect hob star, which my hob stars aren't that great at all. But if you look at Anna's, she has these intricate patterns. They're in, I don't know if you can all see this on the screen, but the star-like shape in the center of those leaves, it's a hob star. And that has a nice circle in between those lines. This is something that's very, very tricky to do. It takes years of practice in order to make these intricate patterns. Now, I want to direct your attention back to Aaron because he is going to pick up this grawl that they have made together. 
Uh, George is on standby at a pickup box. Uh, they've had to slowly heat this grawl up over, I believe they heated it up over 12 hours. So you can see his pieces in there. He has a blowpipe. A blowpipe has some clear glass off the end of it, but it's hollow all the way through. Look how big that grawl is. You know what? I think they deserve a nice round of applause because it's made it made it back into the furnace. You can see some of that design up there from our view inside of the furnace. Um, really nicely done. Now, Aaron is going to take some time. Uh, they're going to melt out texture that's in the pattern. So the piece that's going around, you can feel how deep Anna cuts. It's probably an eighth of an inch down into the surface. If Aaron gathered straight onto this bubble and there was any texture, any deep cuts like the one that's being passed around, he would collect air bubbles in that texture and ruin the pattern that Anna worked so hard to create. So he'll take some moments here and really keep, keep the glass hot, melt it out, fire polish the, the material. Now with Anna, you know, she can smooth out the texture. The piece that's going around has a white cut mark to it. The piece that Anna is working on, the cuts look white, even though she's working with clear glass, and that's because it has a tooth or a grain from the wheel. What Anna could do is she could pick it back up in the hot shop and fire polish away any of that uh, markings, which I'll, I'll th hand around another piece. So this is one that Anna cut and it has been picked back up into th in the hot shop and then fire polished. So they got rid of that grain or tooth. Uh, when you pick an item that's been cold worked back up into the hot shop and you use heat to fire polish away any of that surface, you lose definition. When glass heats up, it wants to puddle, so it balls together. And with Anna, if she wanted to polish something, she could go through a succession of grits through her piece or through her wheel, right? So she could go from a really heavy, rough cut wheel down to a finer and finer and finer wheel, down to pumice and cerium, and then she could give it a bath in acid, hydrochloric or sulfuric acid, and this would take away the final grit or grain that you see from cut glass. This, this keeps that definition from cutting into the material. For our streamers online, if you have any questions, we have Amanda here as well. You can go ahead and ask her. If she can't answer, I will. Do we have one? Here, okay. Let me ask Anna. I will, I'll get, well, I'll, I'm gonna ask Anna on the microphone so you hear the question. I'll let her stop cutting so I don't distract her. What was your inspiration for this pattern, and does it have meaning to you? The one on the grawl, I believe. Um, I'm just inspired by um, tribal patterns. Um, so she's been inspired by tribal patterns, whether it's Native American or you mentioned New Zealand. They have a lot of uh, tribal patterns down there as well. Uh, so those patterns speak to her. Now, I've cold worked the glass, and. I don't know if you'd agree, Anna, but sometimes these patterns just happen while you're cutting. There's a lot of geometry that repeats itself from culture to culture. Yeah, is that right? So this pattern was mostly free-handed, but you drew inspiration from these different tribes. Very good. Was there another question out here in the audience? Did I walk by? It is very pretty and pretty cool, I agree. Yep, so Aaron will use a succession of tools that um, some of them are very surprising to use on glass. The pad he was just using is newspaper. It's folded up, soaked in water, and when the glass touches it, there's a barrier of steam protect or created, and that protects Aaron's hand and the paper. Uh, the paper does not last as long as our blocks. So the blocks, which you'll see Aaron use later on when he gathers glass on top of this, are made out of cherry wood and they're soaked in water. Uh, the blocks can last for a very long time. We have a block that's on one of our stages and it has lived for three years 
So it's just because it's soaked in water, right? And it's made out of cherry wood. But we use cherry wood up here for a very specific reason, and that's because it has a dense grain. And that means it will burn away evenly in our dry wooden tools, and it holds the water very well in the wet tools that we use. We'll also, it looks like Aaron has taken out a V board down here on the floor. It is by our cameraman's foot. So we'll use that later too for those of you live streaming. Um, well it's a V board, it's two boards connected together in a V. It's very creative terminology, I know. But we'll see it used here in just a moment. This V board, um, I believe, it looks like it's cherry, but it's also coated and soaked in water, so coated with newspaper and soaked in water. Aaron's going to turn into this board and get a really nice symmetrical cylinder from using that tool. All right. Yeah, any other questions? These are good. Yeah. Yeah, why, what's the difference between the pad of newspaper and the table? So the pad of newspaper is a very gentle shaping tool. Um, Aaron can really control the form with his hand. But the metal table is a great big heat sink, and it's also very aggressive at flattening the glass. Remember, our goal right now is to smooth away the texture and not lose the pattern. So he can, as long as he rolls in an even manner and doesn't maybe turn in one direction too long while on the table, he will really, really smooth out that texture. We don't want any bubbles in this piece. Some glass blowers like bubbles in their piece. It's a sign of the hand making process. Uh, there are ways to get uniform bubbles in the piece. Um, but a lot of the time, especially for a pattern that Anna has put so much work into, we don't want any air bubbles. What is the biggest TV you've made glass so far? What is the biggest thing Aaron has made in glass so far? Oh, the, the biggest TV, I have no clue. These are 80 inch though. I think that's pretty big, yeah. Yeah, question up there. Yep. Yep. Why is it still white? Okay, so if we look back at the bottle here that Aaron has created, I, I would pass around, but it's heavy, um, and I'm scared of picking it up. There's a lot of work that's gone into it. Um, in order to create the grawl, there's been, so imagine one bubble and glass off the end of a blowpipe. What Aaron did was drop some, this one's ruby on the inside, right Aaron? Ruby, white, and black. And then where the glass is attached to the blowpipe, the layers of color are ruby, white, and ruby. So Aaron has also been practicing um, our Swedish overlay technique. And that's what you did with all of these, right? the Swedish overlay. So a, a Swedish overlay is, I really I might have a hard time explaining this, so bear with me. You take a bubble that's off the end of a blowpipe and you take a cup that you've already made and kind of push it onto the bubble, right? So you have this cup off the end of a bubble. And you take a special pair of tools and you push the cup so it unrolls over the bubble itself. Whatever color was on the inside of that cup you stuck on to the bubble will roll out and be on the surface. So it's really important that the setup was right so that Anna didn't have to work as hard to cut through those layers. She didn't have to put too much texture in the glass. Boy, I hope I explained that all right. Did you all kind of get it? You know, I should be over at the whiteboard. I feel like I'm a professor in college. Yeah. Yeah, so the piece that Aaron is working with, uh, the question was, what are the exact colors? Aaron has encomoed or joined two of these bubbles that he's created a Swedish overlay on and Anna has worked through, now he's joined them lip to lip. So one section, the section that is furthest away from Aaron and closest to the audience right now, the layers from inside to out are ruby or pink, white, then black, okay, so from inside to out. On the top, the part closest to the blowpipe, from inside to out, the layers are ruby, white, and ruby. Okay. We can kind of see that right now up on that 
view from the camera. Okay, so they're fa right now they're fairly true to their true colors. I mean, if we look at the bottle that we've already created on the Marver next to Anna, it does have a similar color to what Aaron is working with right now. All right. Oh, we love this, yeah. How long has Anna been cutting glass for? How long have you been? Four years. Four years all together. So that's a, that's a lot of experience. That is very impressive, isn't it? I, I can't stress enough what a treat it is to have Anna here. Uh, she's, she's really shown us how quickly you can work with the glass, how fast you can cut, and the faster you are, but still be precise. Right. If we look at Anna's pattern, it would be so easy to miss a line by a millimeter. And then if you miss one line, having that swooping arc meet up with the next part of the pattern is extremely difficult. Uh, so she has a very symmetrical pattern right now. All of the points line up. Um, you can see she has marked out some of the pattern. But remember, the pattern that is on Anna's and Aaron's piece is all freehand. Right. A third one. Why did we have to warm up the glass before we had to work with it? Okay, why did we have to before we had to work with it? So the glass that we use cannot be heated or cooled too fast or it will crack and break. Uh, this was a lot of work that Anna and Aaron have put into the piece. So two cups that were Swedish overlaid and, and como together and then cut by Anna. So that's a lot of work. I'm, I'm not quite sure actually how many hours of work went into this. Aaron, do you know how many hours of work went into this grawl? No. On your end. Okay, two and a half hours just to make the hot part. How many hours did it take for you to cut it? Two and a half. Two and a half. So we're going to say about five hours. Math is not my forte. Two plus two, three, four, five, and a half. Yeah, about five hours. Five hours <laughs> into this piece of glass already. And now we're looking at spending another hour, hour and a half, maybe even two hours finalizing the piece. So a lot of work has gone. Did, one second, I had a question here. Yep. What's the what? The end use. Well, I think if we look at the bottle, you could fill it with whatever you wanted to. Um, maybe a, a bushel of flowers, or it's going to look just like this. Actually, if we look at the whiteboard behind Anna, that's what the final form is going to be. All right, so we, Anna drew this very talented. It's a very good illustration of what they'll be making is the bottle behind Anna, the one that's like up here. Yeah. Yeah. No, so it doesn't, the question was why it's these tiny little puffs that were blowing into the blowpipe and the air still moves. Um, is it because the air inside of the glass expands? And I would say minutely, if that. I don't like to say that the air really expands in the glass because it's heating up as it goes down the blowpipe. Now if we imagine this piece, the piece is already full of air and the blowpipe is already full of air. So when we're inflating the glass, we're just pushing that air further into the piece. You don't need a lot of breath to actually fill the blowpipe. Oh, let's watch here. This is going to look great. I always love a fresh gather of glass put onto a pattern. So he's taking a strip gather. What a great shot. Sometimes I wish it would stay that color. Isn't that amazing? We'll get a couple other really, really good close-up shots of this. Now, Aaron, he took a strip gather. This pulled the glass off around the grawl to a point. On a shape like this, if he had kept all of that glass, he would have had maybe what glass blowers call dog ears. 
like two lumps of glass that come off of the piece. It's not uniform. You guys just yell at me if you need anything. Yeah. Did you do all of the cuttings for your girl? Did I? Oh, so thank you. Yeah, I also have a, a YouTube video online where I cut into a girl piece. Thank you. And I did. I cut it all, all myself, and then picked it up. Yes. So it is. It's nice to see a, a piece from start to finish. Um, you can see the concentration on his face. You know, these they're two different worlds, but they're also very similar, which which I really like. Yeah. Yeah. So you're noticing when he touches the glass, the glass changes color, right? Well, the glass is changing color because it's changing temperature. But remember, you know, we we did see some of the true colors when the glass was around 900 degrees Fahrenheit. That's when it was its coldest. Now, Aaron allowed it to get that cold, so it set up, and he could gather more glass on top of it without, say, losing the entire grawl into the furnace or collapsing the bubble that's already inside. He picked up a lot of weight off the end of the blowpipe. Okay, so all of that weight can really distort the glass. It can distort the pattern. That's another reason why he let some of that glass fall off. Yeah, good question. Yeah, how does Anna keep from cutting her hands while she's working? She's made out of stone. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I really am sorry. Um, she, like I said earlier on, the blade is not sharp like a blade that you would cut through wood, right? And it's more like a file. It's going to slowly, thank you, slowly grind away layers of glass. Um, the piece that Anna is cutting as well um, the edges are not sharp. It was all made in a hot shop. Um, so we have another one that's up here. The edges that she's cutting aren't sharp to your hand. They just give a texture to the piece. The upper lip of the vessel, this was made in the hot shop. It's not sharp. Where it would have been sharp, the punty mark, well, we fire polished that so she wouldn't cut herself. She's also taken a moment to grind away that part anyways. Um, you know, we wanted to make sure Anna's safe. We wouldn't give her any sharp glass to cut. Uh, this is one of, this is a similar pattern to what Anna is working on here. So this will be uh, the final, the final pattern. But she said it has more scallops or leaf-like designs in the side. I'm, not, I'm just going to Vanna wipe this for you. Um, I'm not going to pass this one around because I believe the final goal is to pick this one back up in the hot shop and fire polish it. So this is another thing we'd have to bring up very, very slowly because she's cut into the glass. There's strain she's created from cutting into the glass. And remember, we can't heat our glass up too fast or cool it down too fast because it will crack and break. A lot of time went into this piece. So I'm actually going to give it to you. Hey. And we can't keep it. We got to fire polish it first. Oh, I know. We got to wait. Second yeah. So what happens if Anna cuts too deeply? and makes a hole in the piece. Um, there is really, you can't really save a piece once you've cut all the way through it, can you? I mean, you can try and make it part of the pattern by repeating that deep cut over and over and over again, but then you're just losing stru structural integrity to the piece of glass. Um, again, Anna knows just how hard to push and how deep she's cutting because of those years of experience she has uh, studied as a glass cutter. So remember, Anna's from Austria. They have a special glass trade school based out of Kramsak, and that's in uh, a Tyrol, a state of Austria. So they have a specialty glass school that she's studying at from, from a fairly young age. She's on her way to being a, a master glass cutter. Yeah. Not, no gloves, no gloves yet. 
Um, you can see, yeah, it's be careful, yeah. Uh, we, that's a fairly common question we get asked as glass blowers. If you look at Aaron right now, though, he has taken a second. Oh, yeah. Oh. Bless you. That's a good time to sneeze. <laughs> all right. Look at all of that glass. Can we give Aaron a round of applause? <laughs> Did you see that, Anna? Oh, they're going to dump some more of it off. <laughs> What do you think so far, Anna? It must be heavy. Yeah, it must be heavy. It's good that George is here. Yep, it's good that Aaron's here. There, there are a lot of our uh, heavy lifters here at Corner Museum of Glass. Yep. Back to the question about gloves, though. We don't wear them normally on a piece like this. Um, the newspaper's wet, so on the right hand, if you're wearing a glove and that glove gets wet, you're going to get a steam burn through it, just like steam's created on the newspaper. If Aaron got too close with the glove, you know, that steam is created. We also need that dexterity in the left hand. So yes, George is going to help turn, but a glove would get in the way. Um, Aaron also couldn't sneak his hand up to the heat. He might go up too high in a glove and burn himself through the glove before he knows it. Um, this pipe is also going to be hotter than normal. Just because he was in the furnace, gathering for longer. So it's going to really help to have a, an extra pair of hands here. Here we go. All right, they're going to yell at me if they need me. I had a question here, though. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. In the AV booth, can we roll the gathering animation for our viewers? Okay, so this is what Aaron did. And I want you to remember how much glass Aaron had at the end of the blowpipe. Uh, because of the surface area of the grawl and that other gather, he collected a ton of glass. I mean, this is a very large, heavy piece of glass right now. It is also fighting George and Aaron, all right? So not only is it maybe 15 to 20 pounds of glass, that glass is hot, and it's moving, and they constantly have to fight gravity from keeping it on the blowpipe, from keeping it from falling off of the blowpipe. So this is like a, you know, you can kind of control a screaming toddler if you hug them and calm them down. This is a screaming toddler off the end of a blowpipe. It is kicking and screaming and fighting them every inch of the way. I have another question. Did you, you was it you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a good a, a good observation. So if Anna had a larger piece, would she need special equipment to cut it? Anna, what's the largest piece of glass you've ever cut into? Did you need a sling system? Yep. Okay, so, so the largest piece that Anna has cut into was a piece of lead crystal glass that was 13 inches wide and four inches deep. Did you wear anything special for that or you just held on? Yep, so Anna put a wrap around her wrist to help support the weight. Uh, here at Corning Museum of Glass, we just refurbished uh, revamped, if you will, the Crystal City exhibit, which for those of you who are here, if you haven't seen it yet, you need to go see this exhibit. It's in the center of our 35 centuries of glass. Right now we have the largest punch bowl on display. Now for that piece of glass, they had a sling and an armature hooked up to it so that they could push the glass in its different angles instead of holding up all of that weight. To give you an idea, of how much that piece weighed or weighs, uh, which I don't know the overall weight, but I know that 50 pounds of glass were cut away from it. And it still has uh, this brilliance about it. It's still a, a hefty piece of glass. So they had uh, special equipment to help them lift it. I know some people will um, yeah, set up a sling system, just help support the weight of the piece. 
So we, we did revamp the Crystal City exhibit because we are celebrating 150 years of glass blowing coming here to Corner New York. And one of those is a, a special pattern that Anna is working on. Uh, it's called the, the wedding pattern or the Crystal City pattern. It's another one that's on display in our gallery, um, but it's very, very intricate. And I mean, you can't tell you how much work went into that piece just, just to get the detail. It's really, truly gorgeous. Yeah, about how heavy with the rod included do I think that is? The pipe is probably at least 12 pounds. The glass is, I'm guessing, at least 15, 15, 20 pounds. So 30 to 40 pounds altogether. Aaron and Anna were stretching before the show, just, just to give you an idea of how much effort Aaron knew was going to go into this piece. Uh, so stretching out the back, the arms. Anna did the same, which is important, standing there, supporting the weight of the piece of glass. There's a lot of things you have to consider when you're a glass blower or even a glass cutter, and that's the wear and tear on your body. When you do a lot of repetitive things, it has an effect on how your body functions. Yeah? Okay. I can ask her. Yeah. So do you do you have to vary your techniques depending on working with soda lime glass or crystal? Okay. Yeah, so the techniques don't make a lot of difference. She uses the same techniques. I think that's the same with a glass blower using soda lime glass versus lead crystal. Uh, with soda lime glass, Anna has to push harder. Lead crystal glass is softer, so she doesn't have to use quite as much pressure. Um, we are sitting in what was the Steuben crystal glass factory. This used to be the factory floor, in fact, I've seen a picture of Aaron working on this floor some years ago, of course. Um, he was, was a gaffer for Steuben. So this is really a, a full circle of, of different things for Corning. Uh, we've got uh, Anna working here as a cold worker. We've got Aaron working in his, in his old hot shop where he would have been working for Steuben. And, uh, Yes, another question. Yeah, this one's from Ashley. Did you the Yeah, can in the AV booth, could you focus on the cut glass pieces closer to Anna so that our viewers online have an idea of what uh, what she is making tonight? All right, just for a refresher, and for those of you just joining us online, welcome. This is what she's working on. We have a bottle on your far right of the screen. This is a similar pattern and shape that Anna is going for. The bowl in the center is a similar pattern to what Anna is cutting into the glass right now. Okay. All right, yeah, you're welcome. Hey, yeah, we got another one here. How much do Home decor trends affect the work that's done color and color trends. Anna, do you cut glass on your own time and sell it? Do you notice a trend in pattern or color that's more popular nowadays or? No, not really, no. So, you know, we probably do see a, a, a change depending on what era we're talking about. You know, uh, cut glass has been made in Corning, New York for 150 years. Uh, the first one was the Hawks Company, and then our Daily Whore Company, and then we had uh, Hawks branch off from that and start the Stupen Crystal Glass Company with Frederick Carter. So we probably did see a shift and a change from designs when he branched off to create Stupen. Um, but yeah, all, all lead crystal mostly is clear. We have a few pieces in our collection that are 
I would say, a cameo where they have a colored glass on the outside. And then like Anna's doing right now, cutting through that colored glass and exposing the clear underneath. Um, now, we don't use lead crystal glass here for a couple of reasons. One, we like to put a lot of color in our objects. And this would cover the optical purity of lead crystal. Lead crystal is also heavier. So it, it's a lot more muscle to work with. Um, it's softer, but that's great for a glass cutter and a, a glass blower. Yeah. Can you go back and grab yeah, sure. I'll go on this side. It's a little, a little faster. So I'm going to run in here. I'm going to help out so we don't smoke out George. They're going to use the V board that I mentioned earlier. Which way do you want me to blow, George? Blow it. All right, that's how you get a very nice cylinder. All right, it's bowed out slightly. All right. All right, so I'm going to jump in here, help out. And uh, things will start moving very quickly. Uh, you might be wondering, where's the neck to our bottle? That is another uh, object that Aaron has in our pickup box. So we'll need to be able to get that out of our pickup box and apply it to the top of a piece. And that's why we have this uh, other contraption out on the stage. We have a lineup machine. That's also full circle because it came from Stuben. So we'll be using that later on to line up the components, the neck of the piece with the body of the piece. All right, so they're going to get ready to punty it. I'm going to help out with a torch. So at this point, we're allowing the bottom to cool while maintaining temperature in the top. All right, so a little communication, pretty important, especially during this part of the process. Uh, we've reached the punty transfer. So George is going to create the punty. I'm sure some of you noticed that it is on a blowpipe. Yep. They will not be blowing through it, however. Uh, this is just for extra stability. Uh, George also asked Aaron if they should create a ring punty or a dome punty. Just as the name implies, a dome punty is a straight dome of glass off the end of the rod. A ring punty is like a donut. So a straight cylinder from the sides, but if you looked at it from the top, a donut. Uh, this will give them a, a little extra stability, a little, little more support. It'll break off, obviously, in a different way. But it's less risk of breaking out the bottom of the piece. All right, so for everything to work out just right, the punty that George is creating has to be the right size, shape, and temperature. Oh, our piece has to be the right temperature as well. Uh, 
Um, for those of you who are not holding your breath, this might be a good time. There are a lot of work. Five hours have already gone into this piece. But you know, the guys have a lot of experience between them. George has got about 30 years, and Aaron has 20. So this should work out very well. All right, now Aaron is in a holding pattern. Are you going to have George put this on? Yeah. George, I'm going to put your jacks off the end of this bench, or you want them on the marver? All right. Make sure they're all set up. All right, so George is going to apply the punty. This is a little different. Normally, the person sitting in the bench applies the punty, but I think all of you can see how far away the, the end of the piece is from Aaron. But it's also very wide. Right, the bottom of this piece is wide, so if Aaron tried to reach around it and put the punty, it might miss center, which with a ring punty is a, not, not a good thing. was moving your obstacle course. So here we go. Finding center. All right, let's give them another round of applause. All right, I know a lot happened there, but I kind of like everyone to appreciate the tenseness of that situation. Um, also like to hear if I need something from me. So everyone had full, converse, uh, full concentration on the piece, which is very important, especially for this part of the process. I will be in the stage for the rest of our live stream because they will need a pair of extra hands when they start to join the pieces together. Um, I have, it looks like a moment, if you had any questions about
about that part of the process. It looks pretty sharp. Yeah, they're going to take a second and smooth away the sharpness. Yeah. Oh, the guesstimated market value of something like this. Priceless. You heard it. I heard it out there. It's true. Um, you know, I can't put a price. I can't give you a number because I am here at Corning Museum of Glass. I'm one of their employees, and we are a world-renowned facility in the glass world. Uh, so if I did give a value, it w I could overvalue or undervalue a niche somewhere in the world, um, which I would hate to do to Anna and Aaron's piece of glass to undervalue it. What I can say is that there is cut glass in our gift shop. You can go down there and get a comparison. I'm not pushing sales. You, you know, Just look. Um, there is a lot of cut glass that is in our glass market, and a lot of it I think you will be surprised and then walk with your hands very close to your sides when you go buy it, because it can be a pretty hefty price tag, especially on handmade glass. Uh, something I want to cover really quick before I get your question. Um, when you're looking at handmade glass, there's a lot of things to take into account for. You're looking at the glass blower or glass cutter's experience with the material. You know, a lot of us went to school, like Anna went to school to learn this. Um, you're also looking at the time we have to pay to a studio to rent out the facility and make our work. We have to pay for the glass and the color and our assistance because no one works for peanuts anymore, right? We also have to pay ourselves. So there's a, a huge overhead when we're talking about handmade items versus things that are mass produced that a machine can pop out, you know, two every second, right? That's, there's a very low overhead for that. All right, they're going to yell at me again. I know you had a question here. Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah, if we're not working for Corning, do we sign our pieces and mark them anyway? If we are working, a lot of our pieces down here will have CMOG 2018 to mark the place and the year they were created. Um, I know Aaron. You know, individual artists, when we rent time at the studio, we will take a moment to sign them. Aaron, do you sign your work when you make it over to the studio? Oh, yeah, yeah. And we can do that with a Dremel tool. I know some glass blowers have a stamp, so you can heat the glass up with a torch and then stamp the glass with your brand. Yeah. So normally you will see a marking on a handmade piece of glass. Do you want me to do that? Or Frederick's got it. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Uh, lifting up the glass now and putting it into the furnace. So it's, you know, about 30 to 40 pounds. It's still on the same blowpipe. Um, but there is a lot less glass because we've lost the moil or the unwanted, discarded amount of glass, which is on this blowpipe. All of this glass, they're not hefting around anymore. This weighs probably 20 pounds with the pipe and the moil. So now that that is gone, yes, the punty has some glass to it, but it is not as much as that. Uh, so the weight has gone down. Also, the kicking and screaming has gone down a little bit. You know, that, uh, that fresh gather of glass, that's really when we have to work the hardest to keep everything up and off the floor. Yeah, so it's still very hefty. Um, we have this, everyone always asks about the yoke system. You know, we have this yoke that George is rested on right now. It helps him support the glass while he's in the furnace and keep his hand away from the 2,300 degree Fahrenheit furnace. Right, so it's a support system. Now you'll notice when George is moving, when Aaron is moving with the glass, they're very controlled and deliberate. They're not just going to take this glass and smack it down on the bench arms. If they do, any vibration can knock the piece off and onto the floor. So we're really, we're not in the clear just yet. I always like to say you can breathe a sigh of relief when the piece is in the annealer, and even then you crack the doors open, kind of hope that you picked the right annealing cycle, uh, which again, with all of this experience up here, they, they know what cycle they're going to put this on. 
they know how long they're going to cool the glass, which I'm not actually quite sure how long they'll cool it. I'm guessing a 24, 24 hour cycle to cool down to room temperature. Um, if we look, uh, they're going to clean up the form. Maybe in the AV booth, now that we've reached our halfway point, we could focus down here just once more to refresh people who are just joining us on the live stream. Um, we've got these pieces that Anna and Aaron have worked together on. So we still need this neck part. And where we join the neck to the body of the piece, this is a, a very strained connection. The temperature difference is going to be very great between the neck of the piece, the top of the piece, and the bottom of the piece. So they'll need to even that out. And then the bowl next to it is what Anna is cutting here now. Anna is, has joined us from Austria. She has cut glass for four years, and we're very pleased to have her here working and cutting glass. It's something we're really excited to have here at Corning Museum of Glass this summer, celebrate our 150-year tradition. Yeah. Yeah, so some setups will have a yoke system on the bench. So two wheel bearings, which we're, we're going to use this setup here. This has a set of wheel bearings on it so they can stay still and turn in one direction. Some benches have that setup, um, but we don't have it up here right now. It gives Aaron and George a little more control. Yes. What do you need? All right. So Frederick right now is using a Sofieta. He's going to blow into the glass while Aaron's cutting down on it. There's a seal between the cone and the opening of the piece. They'll be able to inflate and get a, a nice clean line at the top of the bottle. Well, that little floral design will be removed here later on, so that they have room to apply the neck to the body of the piece. Any other questions? Can you use some sort of Dremel to cut glass? Yes, you can. Um, you can freehand designs uh, by using a diamond embedded tip and use water. That's the most important thing. If we look at on a setup, you might be able to see the sparkling water uh, that's coming off of the wheel. The water is very important. It keeps the friction down on the piece, so it's not going to overheat. It is also taking all of that glass down and away from Anna's face. Yes, it's a brass wheel with industrial diamonds embedded, not the fancy stuff. Yeah, very important. All right, so they are going to break this off. Do you need a hand? Oh, he's stopping the force. He's going to file it even. Very careful not to get droplets of water on the body of the piece. I'll tap that free. There we go. That piece of glass will get recycled. I'm sorry you can't have it. Take it home. I know it's very pretty. Um, but all of the glass that does not get annealed is a ticking time bomb. So eventually that piece will crack and break. Um, so it does get recycled, though. All of the glass gets recycled either in its cold form. You know, clear glass we can throw right back into the furnace. Colored glass, not so much. We would change the color of our furnace from clear to striated different colors. And then uh, change the chemical composition of the glass, making it harder to work with. So with all the color glass that comes off of our pieces or the glass that pops off of the pipes and rods behind me, 
That gets recycled in three main ways. The first is an aggregate and concrete, uh, so helps in construction materials. Asphalt roads, I recently read an article that said asphalt roads are 99% recyclable because of the amount of glass within them. Actually, I have a reclaimer, so this big, large, long machine that picks the asphalt up, chews it, mixes it back up, and then lays down fresh asphalt behind it. Um, there's also some landfills that use the glass, so it might get thrown into a landfill, but it's concentrated. It's a layer in the landfill. It contains and compresses the landfill and aerates it at the same time, so it decomposes faster. All right. See, I'm sure Anna is getting well underway on her pattern. I have to take a closer look. Already this piece has changed quite a bit. You know, she's changed wheels. Um, Anna uses different wheels for different purposes. It's another similarity between uh, cold cutting and warm or hot working the glass. So there are different wheels for specific purposes, smaller wheels for smaller cuts, longer wheels for longer cuts, different gradations, remember, for rougher cuts versus finer cuts going from rough cut which goes very, very fast to a fine cut and smoothing those details out. All right. All right, so we've got a, a high-powered torch. Aaron is smoothing out the top. You can really see of that beautiful pattern our guest artist, Anna, has worked on. They've inflated and stretched the glass, um, really showcasing her pattern and all her hard work. Yep. Yeah, so right now, he's heating the opening with a high-powered torch that's about 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and he wants to clean up that edge. So he's getting it the hottest. But remember, they have to maintain temperature on the punty. If the punty cools too fast, it could become too weak, and this piece will fall onto the floor. The propane torch is a wonderful tool. They can use it to manage the temperature throughout the entirety of the vessel. So oh, there's not, a, I think a lot of you would agree, there's not a lot of glass blowing. There's a lot of glass shaping and temperature management. Um, but all of these things are just as important as gaining volume and making the piece larger with our breath. Um, very important to not let that piece fall too qu quickly. So it looks like they've got a pair of calipers out. They've measured the opening. This is the time where George is going to pick up the neck and need a wrap around the neck. So another precarious moment in the process. You know, so maybe we... So just listening to the guys communicating, they're thinking that the lineup machine now is too small. Uh, so they like to make larger pieces of glass, but um, the neck and the body of the piece take too much of that center section up for them to use it. So hold on to your seats. It's not over yet. You know, they're going to have to line this up by hand, another very tricky part of the process. Yeah. Yep, yeah. so in Como, is two bubbles. All right, George, you just let me know what you need. OK, what, how big of the wrap? You know, three quarter? OK. Yeah. You want to dip in a half or like just a nice big gather? All right. 
make sure I know, know how much glass to bring over. So a lot of kind of glass blower jargon there, trying to figure out how much glass to bring George. It's going to be out of this black colored glass. Something I haven't really covered is how we get colors into glass. Uh, we start off with soda lime glass. So that's three main ingredients, silica, soda ash, and limestone. In order to get colors, like all of the beautiful colors that Aaron and Anna are working with, a company called Reichenbach, also well, based out of Germany, uh, adds different metallic compounds or basic elements from the periodic table. Uh, so this ruby red colored glass would be from gold chloride. We've got a black colored glass, which has been described to me as a kitchen sink. It's a lot of really heavy metallic compounds like cobalt, iron, manganese. Uh, soda lime glass is different than lead crystal glass because lead crystal has lead or barium introduced into it. These metals make the glass hotter but softer. So it's easier to cut into. It gets hotter quicker for glass blowers. It's easier to shape. Yep. Okay. Yeah. All right, so George is going for the neck. I'm making sure that Aaron is out of the way. Yep. All right, I'm going to start this wrap. Yeah. Now, up until now, the vessel has all been made out of bar color. So bar is very dense and concentrated. But a very quick and efficient way to colorize glass is by rolling through frit, which is what I'm about to do. Um, we will be stretching this frit out, so you won't be able to tell that it's small speckled dots, and it'll be more of a uniform black. I'll get a, but I'll get a couple good coats just in case. No, we don't want any gaps in the color. So now Aaron is in a holding pattern while George and I create what will become the neck of the piece. All right, George, I'm just heating this in. I can marvel it once more or bring it right over. All right, so we're getting ready for this wrap over here on this bench. This wrap will glue the joints together, but it also be really nice camouflage and help the flow of the piece.
All right. George says, get a flash, and we'll stick it up. Yeah. OK. Jacks, paddle, tweezers. We got it. All right, so this is another, again, pretty tense moment. Right? A lot of work has gone into this. Anna's making a good decision focusing on the cold working. She's doing a great job. The great thing about working in Corning is that glass workers come out from the woodworks. Now we've also got Teresa Jorgensen that's joined us. <laughs> All right, so, oh. They're gonna get this hotter. Dancing. It is kind of like a dance here. Okay. They're gonna give it a flash. No rush. I think this is a good moment to just stay out of the way. I'll jump in when, when needed. Okay, everybody knows where they need to be. Got Frederick on the torch. Making sure that connection is just right. Remember, this is all by hand. Yeah, Aaron likes that. Keep going. All right, let's give them a nice big round of applause. It's back into the furnace. It's not over yet. No, it's not over yet. I don't think they need me. Yeah, question. I'm sorry? Is the furnace gas or electric? Uh, if we look up on our view here, we can see the burner um, kind of off the side of the piece. It flickers every once in a while. We are using natural gas and forced air, so these are combustion-style furnaces down here. The amphitheater hot shop is state-of-the-art. We have some really large pieces of equipment. We have air conditioning vents in the floor. We have a limitless supply of torches to hook up to, whether it's gas and oxygen or just propane. We have 13 annealers down here, or slow-cooling ovens. So, uh, they spared no expense when they converted this from the Steuben factory to the amphitheater hot shop. They have done such an amazing job at keeping the spirit of glass alive in our amphitheater hot shop. And now it's, I think it's, it's alive and thriving with Anna here. You know, we have our cold working, which this is called the Crystal City for a reason. There were over 20 cold working shops in its heyday uh, pushing out lead crystal glass that had been cut into. Uh, earlier I mentioned that the Daily Whore Cutting Company, Thomas Hawks um, and Frederick Carter, they all worked here together and a lot of beautiful pristine pieces of glass has come out of this area. So how much chemistry do they teach you when you're learning how to blow glass? Yeah, how much chemistry do they teach you when learning to blow glass? Well, 
For me, I didn't learn too much about the chemistry behind glass in college. I learned how to work the glass in different ways, like cold working, flame working, hot working, or warm working the glass. Um, but Anna, at her uh, glass fuck school or trade school, she learned a lot of the technical aspects behind glass. So she does know a lot about the chemistry um, behind the material. So there are specialty schools that you would want to go to if you wanted to learn about the chemistry of glass and the like of that. There are so many different career paths you can take in the glass community. You can gravitate towards cold working glass. You can gravitate towards hot working glass. You can gravitate towards making color or clear glass. Or you could gravitate towards making uh, the equipment and tools that the glass makers use. Yeah, question here in the front. Yeah, the reheating furnace that George is using right now, I'm not sure how deep it is. Aaron, do you know how deep our reheating furnace is? So like about three feet, just about. We have a larger furnace on the stage. Uh, Frederick is standing next to it right now. That one is deeper. I'd say it's closer to five feet, five or six feet. And the opening, I think we measured it at 32 inches. So it's one of the largest on the East Coast. Some really amazing pieces of glass have come out of that. So for glass cutting, does it stress the glass? Is there a risk that it could end up shattering on Anna? Yeah, let me, uh, let me ask Anna. Anna, with your knowledge, does cutting into the glass put stress or strain into it? Um, when it's cooled down, it does not put any stress on it. When it's cooled down, so when it's annealed, annealed successfully, it should not put any more stress in it. Yeah. Good. Thank you. That's a good one. All right. Yeah, any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> no, we don't make football helmets. You know, we do a special program here at Corning Museum of Glass called You Design It and We Make It. So if you go up by the admissions lobby, they have pieces of paper you can draw onto. And then if you're lucky, a glass blower will choose it and then make it on the amphitheater hot shop or as a flame worker upstairs. They're cleaning up this edge again. We really want this connection to be colder than the punty. All right. We're going to open it now. All right. They're really focusing the heat on where they want it to move. We have to be very careful, though, of that punty connection. There's a very tight line connecting the piece to the punty. You know, they, they, that's where they will break it off eventually, but very, very important to make sure it doesn't drop too much in temperature. The flat. Oh, 
oh, you know, I'm not sure I'd have to see it to know how it was made. So it's very hard to explain how a piece was made if I don't actually look at it with my eyes. Oh, thank you. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, pretty pieces of glass in our market and in the collection. We have tons and tons of stuff to see in the glass market and the collection, I should say. Corner Museum of Glass has the largest collection of glass in the world, over 50,000 pieces. Uh, we also have the studio, which world-renowned glass makers, glass cutters as well, come out to teach. Um, Max Erlacher is one of those people. He and his wife Kitty are locals. Um, they, I mentioned Anna's school earlier, and Max is a pretty famous cold worker that worked for Stuben. Um, he comes out and teaches classes over at the studio, so glass cutting classes. I know Kitty has a fantastic collection of Stuben over on Market Street that you should check out if you're here for a couple of days. Uh, does Corning Museum of Glass have a feeder school? Not in the, the fact that it's like a university, but the studio is a world-renowned teaching facility. So people come from all over the place to teach and learn from glassmakers who have been doing this for a really, really long time. Yeah. Um, so there's a, a lot of experience. Not only do we have Corning Museum of Glass, the studio as well, but we also have the Ray Cow Research Library, which holds one of the largest buckets of knowledge devoted solely to glass. They have manuscripts, they have recipes, they have stories. I know over there there's an exhibit called Curious and Curiouser where there are staff picks, just oddities that people have found in our collection and are on display um, over there. So this campus really holds three main buildings. The museum where our demonstrations and collection are held, the studio where classes and the make your own section are held, and then the Ray Cow Research Library with all of that vast knowledge just behind it. All right, yeah. Sure. No. Yeah, the punty should not affect the pattern of color when they break it free. So if we look at the punty connection, what they've done is put a constriction in the clear glass. So this constriction is where they're going to stress it out and break the piece free. When they break this punty free, a small patch of clear will come off with the punty, but in a very defined pattern or a very defined shape. So it's just going to be a little ring, a little donut of glass left over from that break. This is something that uh, can be cold worked off, can also shock it off, but I don't think the guys will risk it on, on this one. All right, so they're really focusing the heat on the opening of the piece. Anna has joined. Anna, do you approve? It is very big, yes. She said she knew, she knew it was going to be big, but she didn't know it was going to be this big. Yeah. So she did. Look at her face in the background. That's a perfect shot right there. I think she's approved. She's added her stamp of approval. <laughs> perfect. Who's putting it away? So someone is going to suit up and catch this piece of glass when it breaks off of the punty, and then we're going to load it into an annealer. Uh, we'll put it in an annealer, and it's going to slowly cool down to room temperature so that everything can cool down to the same temperature at once. Remember, there's a big temperature difference between the entirety of the piece. Uh, for those of you joining us online and for those of you who are not sticking around Corning Museum of Glass for the next maybe three days until this piece is out of the oven, uh, we will post a picture of it up on our Facebook page. So you'll be able to see it room temperature. Um, I'm sure that Anna and Aaron are going to pose with it, right? 
Amanda says she's going to make them pose, which I don't think Anna has a problem with. I don't think Aaron does as well. This is a nice. Yeah, he will, I'm sure. A really fantastic pattern. I hope we get another close up shot of that pattern that Anna, our guest artist visiting from Austria, works so hard on. Very nice. So again, inspired by tribal designs, free-handed cut, then slowly heated back up and picked up in the hot shop by Aaron. I think this is a really great collaboration between a cold worker and a glass blower, right? Really a nice, a nice homage to our history here at Corning, New York. They're going to do another flash. George is on the ready. He's got a pair of Kevlar gloves and a face shield. He's going to catch the piece in his hands. Now oh, that inside view is awesome. You can really see the, well, when it was in there, you can see the pattern. All right, we're gonna get Anna in on this, the hot side. She's going to help break it off. Right on the jack line. Yeah, they'll, oh, this is, this is great. They're gonna break the piece off together. There we go. Into the annealer, safe and sound. Let's give Anna Knoll, Aaron Jack, and the team a nice big round of applause. And George, heavy lifting George. Yeah, yeah. Anna, beautiful pattern. Nicely done. All right. Well, on behalf of the team here at Corner Museum of Glass, thank you for tuning in on our live stream. For the rest of you, if you have any questions, come on down. But if not, we're open for another 30 minutes or so, so have a great night. Corner Museum of Glass, thank you.